I'm just getting home from our coven's summer solstice um, Sabbath, which we had a little bit later this year. Um, we had it like towards the end of June <clears throat> because people had work and it was like the closest available Saturday pretty much to the actual Sabbath because I think uh, the solstice was like on a Wednesday this year. But I have been outside in like 90 degree heat for like eight hours. Oh my God, I'm so hot and tired. And this all needs to come off. Oh. You guys see how hot? Like I look like gross, gross. The first thing I did when I got home is I took off like all the clothes I was wearing and pretty much threw them into the wash because we were out in the woods and stuff too. So don't want to bring anything home with me. But yeah, the Sabbath was really good. Um, we had some more witches take gray cords and then we had our petitioning, which the talents this year at the petitioning honestly really blew me away. Like they were so good. Um, and we had a really good pitch in and like I ate like my body weight and turkey sliders and I'm just like dead right now. Like I feel so filled with magic and like, covenry and camaraderie and like so at peace with this aspect in my life like spiritually but I'm also so drained from the ritual and from the sabbat and also from the heat like I'm a very heat sensitive person so it takes a lot out of me um thankfully I did bring a couple canopy tents so we had a little bit of cover um but the main altar space was just there was no shade um but it was nice, it was a lovely ritual. I'm gonna include like some little pictures and videos and stuff of our Sabbath rite, probably in this vlog. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna keep doing this, this vlog style stuff, it's fun. So I just got finished up filming my Southern Cunning by Erin Oberon book review video for the channel here. And I just wanted to hop on here and kind of give you guys a little bit of tea in regards to like the vlog that I'm working on. So I was editing a little bit of like the footage and the photos for the vlog and oh my gosh, like I was so, so tired and like heat stroke after our summer solstice ritual that I really didn't give you guys like hardly any information. I just kind of like word vomited while having a heat stroke when I got home. Our summer solstice ritual was absolutely amazing this year. We actually used like a new location in the woods that we hadn't used before. And it was really nice being able to, prior to the ritual, work more with the spirits of our land and really tap into like that witch council and have them lead us and guide us to a new ritual site. And the ritual site was perfect. It was private. It had access to a main trail. Um, and it also had some grills and there was a gorgeous tree stump in the middle of the ritual site that we were able to use as our altar. Um, loved it, loved the whole thing. I love summer solstice. I don't necessarily love the heat. It gets pretty hot pretty much from summer solstice till the fall equinox. It consistently stays typically a minimum of around 80 degrees, if not sometimes even higher. It used to not always be like that. I remember like my birthday is towards the end of September and growing up, it felt very much like fall around my birthday. I'm born right after the fall equinox. I'm a child of the equinox, if you will. But lately in like the past five years, it's been like in the 90s on my birthday, which is just problematic. But the ritual went really well. Um, there are aspects of that that I won't be sharing in this vlog, of course. But after the ritual, we also had our petitioning. Um, and the petitioning was stunning, just amazing. Um, part of the petitioning is also like displaying a talent. And then the other part is kind of like a round circle sort of discussion, right? Uh, having a conversation around boundaries and expectations and moving forward to the path to the court of the sun, going from, you know, a petitioner to an initiate, um, which is all sort of part of our coven's process when you are entering the first degree. So yeah, the talents this year, I mean, I feel like I say this every year, but the talents this year, I just think hit different. Um, 
maybe it was the ritual location that we used because we had access to like the woods and um down the trail from where our ritual site was there was this gorgeous like deep ravine um and kind of like a cliff side as well and so like the talents the musical talents like the flute and singing really echoed throughout the woodland and it just really created this etheric sort of feel um and you know those talents are not like just simply a way of petitioning but they're also kind of a way to show um the individual witches art and talents because that's what our coven wants to inspire and uphold our sacred arts and they also glorify the spirits sort of divine offerings to the spirits of the coven and the spirits of the craft as well when moving forward because it's not just the coven that is being petitioned for initiation it's also us petitioning the spirits to initiate this person as well so it's not really like it's a hundred percent just mine or the coven's decision of who joins and who doesn't um we had a fairly big turnout as far as petitioners go it's pretty common in the beginning of courting season to have like maybe five or six people seeking initiation and seeking to be on the path to the court of the sun which that's our first degree essentially it's pretty common to have five or six of those people but then as the wheel turns and we move through courting season um things happen people you know realize maybe it's not for them or people just don't necessarily think that it's the right time for them or obstacles come up in the way that kind of lead them astray or whatever um and there's no bad blood or hard feelings but it's kind of perceived by the coven that these are omens of direction of like where we should take this and where we should go right um so it's possible to have six seven or eight people all petitioning but also too in most initiatory witchcraft groups they're only going to be initiating maybe two or three three most at one time um it's common for there to be one person that initiates on their own or for a pair, like an initiatory pair to initiate sort of like together. That's also common. It's really not common to have a group of three all at once, but it has been done. It can be done. I personally have not heard of more than four witches being initiated all at once. Not saying that that, you know, or four or more, I guess I should say. Not saying that that doesn't happen. I'm just saying I've just not heard of it. I mean, a lot of initiatory covens are going to have what? A cap of like maybe nine, 10, 13 or so. So initiating more than three or even three people all at once can really greatly affect the overall hive mind of that coven. Um, the hive mind kind of being like the collective spirit or the egregore that the witches of that coven sort of manifest not even necessarily consciously. Um, egregores and hive minds can happen even in like a social circle or a workplace. It's kind of like the spirit of the overall group. And that's kind of why it's not always really viewed as like favorable to initiate, you know, three or more people all at once, because that's putting in a lot of new blood all at once and could kind of be like overflowing the sacred chalice a little bit. Sometimes it's not really a matter of like, your petitioning is declined because you're not liked or respected or you're not wanted in the coven. It could be a matter of like, there just isn't space. And like this year, it was just such a tough decision. It was not an easy choice to make. And like the verdict is still kind of out. Like letters will be sent out later next week, I believe, to the people that, you know, are getting an acceptance letter. It will basically detail their pre-initiation and like what to kind of expect and like pack for and plan for and then also like retreat information and things like that and then the people that are getting a letter that is declining their petitioning um usually that letter will basically indicate that like you should maybe try again next year because it's not always like a no is not always like a fuck you we don't want you here um but it just sucks to have to send those letters out anyway, but that's part of it. So that's kind of something that's like on my mind presently is just like, we have to narrow down these petitioners to get these initiates for this upcoming 
initiation at the first harvest Sabbath during the retreat. And I really enjoy all of them and I really like all of them. Um, and if, it, if I had it like really my way, then some of these things, I mean, I don't know, you know, like if I had it my way, I think it'd be really cool to initiate all of them. But I know that like logically that that's not necessarily the right thing to do. It's kind of hard too, because there's so many aspects of covenry that because this is an initiatory closed practice, like there are things that I want to talk about and things that I want to share because this is such a big part of my life. And I, I like sharing this with you guys, but also some of it I do have to kind of keep like shrouded and like I can't share, which is hard for me sometimes. But anyway, I also have gone on several nature walks um, and hikes because it's that time of year where all I want to do is just like zoom basically on some trails. So we went to a park uh, not that long ago and kind of like walked through those trails. It was a park that I actually hadn't been to before. So that was really fun. Um, I will include some footage of that also in this sort of vlog as well somewhere. Later this week I'm really excited because we're going to be having our Indie Witches Book Club meetup actually um, talking about Southern Cunning and it's our first book club meetup and I don't know how long. Like we haven't had an in-person meetup in a while just because like things have been kind of hectic and crazy. Um, but I'm excited and we're having it in person. Um, and it's going to be really cool. I think it's going to be really cool. It's like a Polynesian themed bar restaurant. Um, and it's like an immersive sort of experience. And we have like a little section. And yeah, maybe I'll get some pictures or videos of that. But I'm really looking forward to that too. <laughs> some of the vlog and I wanted to like just throw a little blurb in here in regards to those solar powered mushroom lights which I believe are from Timu um, which if you're not familiar with that app it's very dangerous because it's just everything is like a really good deal and things are really cheap you know whether or not the app is super ethical uh, you know I think the verdict is definitely out on that but I've been definitely kind of feeling some type of way in general this year because normally I would 
have a garden and like be growing things. Um, and I just haven't really done that this year because we might not be able to take some of what I plant with us. Um, if I really did like my full usual, you know, raised garden beds and planting things in the ground, that's just so much to have to move um, when we do eventually move. And it's been really hard because that's definitely a way that I very much ground myself. Um, and it's also a way that I work with the spirits of the land. And it's been difficult for me, um, more difficult than I expected, um, to not really do that so much this year. And I know that I could put stuff in pots, um, but then we have to move all those pots. And like, I don't necessarily want to do that either. So I am still growing like some green onions and like little things in the house. But other than that, no, I, I don't have an herb garden or a vegetable garden this year. Um, I did plant the enchanted flowers from our May Day Sabbath. Um, I actually put them next to the flowers that came back, which that was in a different vlog. But basically, that's the first time those flowers have ever come back were last year's flowers. So that's pretty cool. Um, I planted this year's flowers next to where last year's are. Um, but other than that, I haven't really done anything else. Um, and I know that like logically, it's like the better idea because it'll be easier later for me. Um, but spiritually, it's kind of felt like that part of my practice is a little bit void. Um, and my partner is like not a witch um, and is really not even so much like spiritual, which is actually kind of what I prefer in a partner. Um, I know that there's plenty of witches who share their practice with their partner, and I think that's wonderful and that's beautiful. Um, but I kind of like just having my partner be very salt of the earth and having my ritual space and my tools and my practice be my own and not having to share. But if that works for you, great, whatever. Anyway, my partner kind of like heard what I was saying in regards to like how I felt about being disconnected to the land and how that's really affected my spiritual health. And I just thought it was really nice that they got me those like solar powered lights because that's like one way to kind of, I don't know, work with the land and like the energy of the land in a way that is non-committal and very easy to like transfer. Um, so I just thought that, that was really nice and I wanted to say a little something about that other than just that one little clip. So recently I was gifted this lovely ritual tool by my friend Elle who owns Bone and Branch. I will make sure to link that um, in the description of this video. I did post about this on like the community tabs area of YouTube, but also on my Instagram and on my Facebook. So feel free to check out those links that are down below as well. But this is the tool. I just think that this is so cool. So this is essentially a um, lapis lazuli metal forged deer antler wand. Um, amazing. L is really like a modern day forge smith goddess. I mean, she makes so many things like ritual jewelry, ritual tools. I highly recommend going to go check her out. That she also sells some of her stuff on consignment um, at our shop, but also some other local witchy stores. So if you're in the 317 area, you might be able to go check out some of her stuff in person. And I'm not totally sure about the status of this, but I believe, allegedly, she might be opening up her own location as well. Just basically gifted this to me. Um, because she's really awesome like that. And like, I have one of her crowns that I've shared here on the channel um, before as well. That's like a deer antlered flower crown. Um, super cool. To squeeze down because this flower crown with these antlers, I'm already pretty tall, but this makes me like giantess sized, which I love. Um, but let me get a closer view for you guys. So she makes these crowns and she also sells oddity items and stones, crystals and conjurations and things like that. 
Bone and Branch, go check it out. I'll leave their links down below as well, but check them out, send them some love. Um, you know, we really gotta support our own witch community here. Let's support small and local artists. So check them out. Cute, like photo shoot sort of moment. So this is a crystal tower point, um, like I mentioned earlier, of lapis lazuli, um, which is a really like popular and prominent stone, especially amongst like the Middle East. Um, and it's heavily associated with like the heavens and the queen of heaven. Um, the eighth gate of Babylon, the Ishtar gate, is supposed to be encrusted with lapis. Um, it's a stone of psychic abilities and it's a stone that is alleged to protect against psychic attacks. Um, very much like a, a witchy sort of general protection from uh, malefica, psychic attacks, the evil eye. Also supposed to enhance uh, psychic abilities as well. This stone is also supposed to be a stone of creativity um, and devotion to the great mother goddess and help to form a connection with that sort of current. A stone that's thought to enhance intuition and also center the witch in their spiritual practice to kind of help get you into that sort of mindset. I will be honest, I am not very much like a crystal girly. Um, I would not really classify myself as like a crystal witch per se. I love crystals and I appreciate crystals and I own actually quite a few crystals. From working in metaphysical stores and new age shops, you start to kind of acquire them. And I've been given many crystals and I do enjoy having them in my space aesthetically. I think they're beautiful. But as far as my actual witchcraft practice goes, I don't really use a ton of crystals. Um, most of the sort of crystals and minerals I use are things like selenite, obsidian, obsidian being like one of my absolute favorites, but lapis is another one that I really am fond of. I also really enjoy amethyst as well. All of the crystals in my practice though are very intentional and like I use them for specific reasons. I don't really tend to make crystal grids. I used to make those more, um, especially when I was working actually at a metaphysical store. Um, I made those, but they just don't really speak to my practice as much anymore, to be honest with you. And there's nothing against crystals. Um, and like I said, I do, I do love them. I do appreciate them. They're just not really a huge part of my practice. This particular wand though, having a lapis point, which is so prominent throughout mysticism and Sahir and magic of the Middle East, really, really spoke to me. Um, I have been fascinated with Ishtar's gate and with the ancient city of Babylon as long as I've known it to exist. Um, and the fact that it's metallurged, I'm not sure if that's the right word, metallurgy, metal forged, I don't know. Um, the fact that it's put on a white-tailed deer antler to me has a great deal of symbolism. So the white-tailed deer antler, these deer are actually native to like our local area. I believe they're found throughout like most of North and South America. Um, I'm not really sure if they're in Europe or other parts of the world, but I know for sure that they're native to where I live. And in working with sort of this genus loci and understanding traditional witchcraft, um, taking the Red Thread Academy course, shout out to Lorelai Black, shout out to Taya Kennedy, shout out to the Red Thread Academy. I've been learning a lot more about the white-tailed deer because for us in our coven, we've always kind of viewed them as like very sacred and we see them fairly often, I would say. We see them at a cemetery that we routinely work at frequently, as well as at our retreat site during the first harvest where we initiate new blood. There's a particular spirit from our tradition that we work with and venerate during May Day that is specifically corresponding to the white-tailed deer. And so this being a white-tailed deer antler just really was like, I mean, I don't think Elle necessarily knew that. She just told me that she kind of looked at her supplies and felt like this particular wand was kind of calling her to give it to me. So I don't think she necessarily knew 
the amount of symbolism and like personal importance that these objects have to me. It's just kind of one of those things where when the witch council and the wise blood whispers, you heed that call, you listen, and it kind of makes sense later. We can also look to the white-tailed deer for signs, symbols, omens, and the changing of seasons. There's a particular time of year where they shed their antlers, and there's a time of year where they have their antlers regrown to their fullest peak. I believe the July Esbat is the Buckmead moon um, because their antlers have regrown to their highest peak um, and that also falls around the time where our coven is sort of wrapping up courting season so there's a lot of personal sort of gnosis around the white-tailed deer i think that it's kind of beautiful that i have this object this ritual tool that represents um sort of the land that i reside on um and paying respects to the spirits of this land, but also anointed with a stone that is so prominent and found within my ancestral culture. Um, sometimes I think within traditional witchcraft, I feel a little bit of a disconnect um, because it can be so heavily European focused, but I really feel like in the heart of traditional witchcraft, it's about connecting to your ancestors, but also connecting to the land that you live on. And I think that this is a really beautiful tool that kind of symbolizes my two worlds sort of coming together. Um, and these two worlds often feel so separate um, and so separated, right? Miles of separation. And I often think about my family still overseas and how different my life would be if I was over there. So yeah, this is just a really awesome tool. And I just feel so honored that she gifted this to me without even necessarily knowing um, the significance that I associate the lapis and the white-tailed deer with. And yeah, the fact that they're just together is amazing. I haven't really used um, wands a whole lot in my practice except within ceremonial ritual. I actually have a whole ritual that I've outlined in Ambrosia's Book of Witch Flight that does incorporate the use of a wand. Um, and so I'm excited to start using this wand in that otherworldly ritual. I just wanted to share that with you guys. So I know I look a little crazy, but that's because I've been outside and it's been storming. I decided that I really wanted to do a sort of Goddess Lilith connection ritual, an empowerment ritual, kind of like a spur of the moment thing. And I took a ritual bath and I have come outside and I did my ritual during the storm. Yesterday we had a Derrico storm um, which is kind of almost like a tornado, but the wind just goes in straight lines forward. We had that yesterday. On top of having smoke from the Canadian wildfires uh, rolling in, um, that was pretty much at its peak before the Derrico storm. And then today and all weekend, we're supposed to have uh, thunderstorms. But I figured I would like to do sort of that goddess empowerment ritual tonight. Um, so for me, one of the things that I like to do during a storm is one, prepare by taking a ritual bath, listening to kind of like instrumental music. I mean, really make it ritualistic. Light your candles, light some incense, apply your oils and your butters after your ritual bath. And then I like to come out outside um, and feel the rain kind of on my skin and do invocations to the heavens while it's storming. I think that it's like very poetic, you know, the sky kind of being like ripped open and singing praises to the goddess. Like, it's just a beautiful thing. And being able to do that sky clad makes it even more empowering. Um, so because of that nature, like I'm not gonna be sharing that um, on the channel but that's what we're doing tonight.
É, 